Hello, everybody. Charles from GMAT Ninja here. Welcome to episode one of our series on data insights. Brand new data insights doesn't even exist yet, about four weeks away from it being part of the brand new GMAT focus. Here's what you're getting into. Today, we're going to focus on graphics interpretation. This is going to be much more about mindset than it is about anything else. So there's nothing you really need to learn. You know what a bar graph is. You know what a line graph is. You've seen graphs before. That's not the point. The GMAT's trying to test you on your real world data skills. Can you process graphs that look kind of like what you see in the real world? So that's what we're going after today. A little bit of context. Data insight section, 45 minutes for 20 questions. So you get about two minutes and 15 seconds per question. What we know right now is that the plan that GMAC has told us is 20 to 30% of all data insights questions are going to be graphics interpretation. They've also said that that's going to narrow a little bit over time. So you might see a little bit more, a little bit less as time goes on. As they launch the GMAT focus, that's their starting point. So four to six graphics interpretation questions out of your 20 on the exam. And these graphics are going to be terrible a lot of the time. It's kind of like that guy. I, I know a lot of you work in these kind of contexts where there's that guy that's like, oh, yeah, I can make you a really good graph. And then he brings you something and you're like, did you just spill coffee on a page and call it a bar graph. That's what a lot of these feel like. So we're going to try to get you in the right mindset for powering through that. Often they're bad by design. Sometimes they're not so bad, but they're deliberately a little bit confusing and not the way you would necessarily want to display this data. And the question is, can you power through it? So here's what I want you to do. Not a lot that's super technical when you're dealing with graphics interpretation, but I want you to digest first, take a look, make sure you can kind of get your head around what's going on here. Um, make sure you kind of look at the graph. What are the axes? What kind of information is being presented? But don't grip too hard. Don't try to boil the ocean, understand every little thing. What happens a lot is you have a graph where you go, I sort of get what they're doing, but I'm not really sure why it's laid out this way. Okay, good enough starting point. A lot of the time, the questions aren't going to pick on every little detail. It's just some chunk of it. So get the gist of it first, then move on. Most important thing by far, huge theme on, on data insights in general. You misread one word. Feels a lot like critical reasoning. You miss that word in the conclusion of critical reasoning. You can get yourself into big trouble. Same idea here. You miss a word or two in the question and get yourself into big trouble. So reread, watch your back, be careful. I'm not saying slow down, but before you move on from the question, I want you to do a little sanity check. Am I answering the right thing? Did I miss a little modifier? That's the big, big, big key here. Now, I, I went through every single graphics interpretation question that's been published so far. Pretty much every single one I missed, it was the that moment of like, oh, I misread that. I, I jumped over a word because I was being hasty. Don't let that happen to you. If you're just starting out with data insights, try to develop really good habits from the start. Reread the question twice every single time so you don't make that mistake. All right, here's what we're doing today. Uh, I've got a pretty good live crowd watching. Thank you, everybody, for being here live. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to go through four questions as usual. My goal here isn't to give you one of each question type. Oh, here's a bar graph, and here's a line graph, and here's some other kind of graph, and here's a flow chart. That's superficial. That's not really what the test is going after. You've seen all of these kinds of charts in real life plenty of times. Instead, my goal is to get you a little taste of the mindset you're going to need to succeed on these questions. A couple of these graphs I've chosen deliberately because I, I think they might freak some of you out a little bit. Certainly, they freaked out our students already a little bit. And some of these I looked at and went, what the heck does this say? So I'm going to warm you up gently with one that's not so bad. And again, I want your mindset to be right. Digest a little bit first. Be aware that there might be too much information, badly presented information. Don't let that freak you out. And if you're taking the test and you see a question, you really can't make sense of it. And you can't make sense of the question either. Be prepared to bail. Special new feature of GMAT Focus. Of those 20 questions, you can come back to three of them and change your answers later. So you always get a second crack at it if you need it. So don't be afraid to say, hey, I'm going to move on if I don't see what's going on here. All right, live crowd. I think all of you or most of you registered to be here. So I know where you live. Tell us what's happening. Tell us your thoughts as you're going through these questions. Give us your answer. Tell us if you're struggling, if you're totally lost, let us know. Really want to get that feedback, want to get that energy going in here. If you don't, I know where you live. I'm going to come and raid your refrigerator. Um, one quick piece of advice, all these Data Insights videos, please watch them on desktop, not mobile, just because there's going to be a lot on the screen a lot of the time. So you're going to have a better experience on desktop. And please, please, please like and subscribe. Have a wonderful, wonderful crew that produces these videos. Abhijit, I love you, man. Um, so yeah, I mean, that guy's going to get fired if you're not liking and subscribing. And that would make me cry. You don't want to see me cry. I'm an ugly crier. All right. I'm going to stop talking. Let's go to the first question. Going to give you about two minutes for this. And again, live crowd, please, 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 as soon as you get an answer or as soon as you feel lost on either of these, punch it into the chat so I can see what you're thinking.
Rev Crowd, give you 30 more seconds. If you're lost, please let me know. Fire your answers in there, please. Helps us figure out what's going on in your heads. All right. If you're not watching this live, feel free to hit that pause button for everybody else. Let's give this a whirl. Okay. So warming you up gently, easiest, I think for most of you going to be the easiest question we go through today. But even this, I mean, if you look at this thing kind of, kind of fiddly, right? I'm pointing in the wrong direction. This is hard. Um, because my screen is going the opposite direction as yours. This is very complicated for me. So this funny little graph here, it's really easy to miscount. It's really easy to misread. It's really, really easy to lose track of what the question's asking you as I'm seeing the answers coming in from the live group, seeing lots, seeing some pretty good answers here, also seeing some folks struggle generally. Bet you anything the deal is you misread or miscounted. Nothing here is rocket surgery on this particular one, but the question is you're being really, really precise in your approach to it. That's what this is all about. All right. So what I did on the board here is I, I just added up the numbers. So every little symbol is 10 students. So you got 10 of those symbols here, 11 here, five here, four here. Um, adds up to 300. That makes perfect sense. This circle, the people that are 30 or older, this one, the people with no high school diploma. First question is asking us, so if a student selected at random, what's the probability that they're either under 30, so who are the under 30 people? So these guys are under 30 here because they're outside of this. These guys are also under 30 or a high school graduate. So anything, this is the non-high school graduates who's a high school grad. Well, these guys again, and these guys are high school graduates or both. So again, here's our both right here, high school graduates under the age of 30. Here's our high school graduates over the age of 30. And here are people, no high school diploma under the age of 30. So those are the folks we're talking about in the question. It's everything but those 50 right there. So this is 250 out of 300. Simplify that. You get five sixths, and that answer is going to be D. Pretty straightforward. But again, what's this all about? What's Data Insights about? A huge chunk of it is, I know it sounds really stupid, but it's going to drive you nuts. Every student we've seen grapple with this, IR on, on executive assessment, IR on the old GMAT, folks who are already getting going on the GMAT focus. That's where half the errors come from. Misreading, miscounting, that kind of thing. Sloppy errors, same thing that some of you heard me bark about on verbal and quant. All right, next one. What's the probability that somebody is under 30, I'm going to erase these little blue check marks here, under 30 and a high school graduate. Well, these are the ones that are 30 and older, so not them. So here's my under 30s, and they're a high school graduate. Well, these are non-high school graduates. I want the high school grads right here, 100 out of 300. That's it, one third, and that answer is going to be B. Okay, hope you guys enjoyed that warm up. Um, now they're going to start getting a little bit gnarlier. This next one looks pretty intimidating. Um, I'm going to toss on the board real quick here. Um, quick note, the part in blue, the reason I put it in blue, this is reformatted a little bit from what you're going to see on the in the MBA.com interface or what it would look like on your screen during a test. Limitations of doing videos like this, we're kind of stuck with this widescreen sort of thing. Um, so I just want to make sure I put that part in blue, want to make sure you didn't miss it. So make sure you read that bit and obviously the bit up on the right side. Give you guys about two and a half minutes here. And again, live crowd, I'm counting on you. Need the energy. So let me know how you're doing on these. Um, if you're looking at this and going, this is painful, I'm miserable. Please let us know that too. That's super helpful.
All right, give me 30 more seconds for the live group. If you're lost, please let us know. All right. I'm going to this up on the screen. Um, I, want, I want to step back for a moment, getting some really interesting questions from viewers I, I want to jump into um, and, and comments as well. Uh, Mark, appreciate you, man. Uh, the first question, it's easy, misread the content. Ha ha ha. Yeah, it happens all the time and it's, and it's embarrassing. And what I see students do all the time, all across the board on the GMAT GRE executive assessment, it's really easy to dismiss those moments where you go, oh, no, I really read it. I, I, I'm fine reading the graph. I understood the heart of it, but I misread it. It's really easy to dismiss that. If you're just getting started studying for data insights, every time you make a mistake like this, and, and I think Mark caught himself, if I'm not mistaken here, but if you make a mistake like that, I really want you to pay attention. Those are the things that are high leverage adaptive tests. Data insights is adaptive, just like everything else on the GMAT. You miss the questions that are easier for you. That's where the wheels come off. Make sure your hygiene, your process is really good from the start. Um, and if you catch yourself misreading, and if that's the source of errors, really pay attention to that. Sometimes these graphs are just going to beat you because they're hard. Don't beat yourself. Let the GMAT beat you. That's the secret to unlocking everything. A couple of good comments about up here as well. I want to address real quick before we hop into this question. Is the calculator allowed in the data insights section? Yes, it is. I'm going to talk about that a whole bunch more, probably in the context of uh, episode two. Two-part analysis is where that calculator is going to be the most useful, arguably table analysis episode three. We'll talk about that. You don't want to lean on the calculator too heavily. We'll get into that just so you know. And getting lots of comments like this from people that have already practiced this, I, I assume. Timing is the main issue, not enough time to read thoroughly, judge, and calculate. Only emails you've first interpreted. Yes, this is exactly the feeling of data insights. Welcome. Pick your battles. If you're lost on something like this, you see a question, you go, I have no idea what's going on. Get out of there. Don't waste your time on the ones that you're going to get really bogged down in. When you look at it and you say, I, I, I think I've got a path forward here. Great. Be careful. Watch your back. Don't misread. Invest your time doing that. There's going to be a few questions that are going to be rough for you. Let them go. It's okay. You, you got that space. Just make sure that you're letting go of the ones that are legitimately hard for you. All right, let's get into this question. Um, I think you need a little less of me and a little more of this. Um, so, all right. Really, really easy to kind of look at this and go, oh, well, there's, there's tons of stuff going on here. What a mess. Look at all those, those lines going everywhere. Very, very typical of data insights in general, not just graphics interpretation. Yeah, you don't need everything. You only need certain things. Maybe you know nothing about chemistry. I'm going to pretend that I have absolutely no idea what's going on here. And I'm going to call them by their letter names as if I have absolutely no background in chemistry. Fantastic, right? Doesn't matter. Nothing's going to pre-assume a whole lot of knowledge about the world. OK, so here, question number one, at 60 degrees Celsius, most soluble of chemicals is most likely. Well, that's pretty straightforward. We can just kind of look at that, you know, draw a line up, that blue line right there. We can draw up from 60 degrees. And what's the most soluble? Higher up is more soluble. That's fantastic. So it must be kind of right up at the top there. Yeah. Um, so that's, oops, I highlighted the wrong thing. But uh, this this should actually be D, right? Because it's NaNO3, not C. That's my mistake on the slide. But yeah, it should be D, NaNO3, right? No. Read carefully. You're going to get tired of hearing me say that. Under the assumption that the curve shown continue in the same general shape. So everything's continuing off the curve, right off the graph. So what does that lead us to? Is there something that's even higher up as you keep going? Yeah, you bet. So that KI line is going to keep going up. Yeah, exactly. And, I, and I'm getting some of the people in live crowd going, hey, you, you made a mistake here, Ninja. Yeah, exactly. But that's a mistake we see people make here really easy to do. And if you get complacent, and you're not really paying close attention, really easy to make those types of mistakes on this particular question. You might be saying, well, that's silly. I didn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, go do 25 of these. If you're not really watching your back, you're going to make similar mistakes. And again, that's the key. Don't beat yourself. Let the test beat you. So there we go. KI in this case, once you take a moment, breathe a little bit and go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is there some way that I might have tripped over my own feet here? Yeah, there's another curve right there, that KI curve. Let me make sure that I'm extending that and thinking through it. Okay. 
So answer on that one is B. Second question, um, more straightforward. Once you kind of get that that sort of gist that, oh, wait a minute, I got to be thinking about things going off the curve or off the graph, the curves continue. So NH4, CI, whatever that means, CL. Okay, well, that's that one. So I'm going to continue that one. So temperature above 100 degrees Celsius. So I continue that one off. Fantastic. Now, my first thought, is there anything coming down from the top? And there, there isn't. But then I can just kind of extend the three in the question there. So I can extend the KCI, the KCIO3, the NACL. Again, you don't need to know anything about chemistry. Just pretend that we don't. Yeah, and there's the one that has to be going up faster than the NH4CL one. Great. There we go. Answer choices be there. So that's it. And it's funny kind of seeing people giving me chemistry lessons in the chat. Um, perfect. But my point is, like, you can know nothing about chemistry doesn't make any difference. And I don't want you to get intimidated. Same thing we say on reading comprehension. Well, I don't know anything about chemistry. Oh, crap. Passage is about chemistry. It's all in your head. Doesn't matter here if you know chemistry. Fantastic. Really fun subject, in my opinion. But it doesn't matter if you know anything, because all these questions are going to assume that you have no prior knowledge. So don't let that freak you out. Don't let the topic freak you out. They're going to deliberately give you stuff that you might know nothing about. Maybe very few people know anything about. Maybe it's totally made up. That's fine. Welcome to Data Insights. All right, these last two, two more questions here today. They're going to get super, super gnarly. This next one just obliterates people. And I'm not going to say any more than that. Let's see if it obliterates the live crowd. So please, please, as soon as you see it, give us your impressions. If you get lost, let us know. Um, and one more time before we get into this third question, if you're enjoying the video, please hit that like button. Please subscribe. Really important to us to make sure we're getting your support. Um, and especially for some of our, our uh, folks who work backstage do amazing things so that I can sit here and blather on endlessly to you guys. Okay. Enjoy this one. Um, and real quick, before I get into that, how much time should ideally be spent on these questions? Um, actually, you know what? Getting a couple of interesting questions here I want to jump into quickly. So if there are two similar lines with upward slope, how do you decide then? So great question, Ashana. I really appreciate that. Here's the thing. For the most part, the question's kind of invalid if they make that the case. You only have three answer choices here. Only one of them is going to really extend in a way that it's clearly going to cross that NH4CL line. Only one is going to do that. They're going to make this fair. They're not going to make it a judgment call. There are questions that will feel like judgment calls on data insights, but something like this, they're going to be really careful to make that unambiguous for you. Um, getting a couple of questions about timing that I think are are fantastic. So approximately how much time should be spent on a question like this? Um, so on average, on Data Insights, you have 2 minutes, 15 seconds. Um, I don't really want anybody going down the road of, well, hey, there's five different question types. So, oh, well, maybe on graphics interpretation, I should take two minutes so that I can take an average of two and a half on multi-source reasoning. Don't go down that road. It's just going to make your life harder. Um, you should be averaging somewhere around two, 215, two minutes and 30 seconds on these. Um, somebody asked, ideally, how much time on this particular question? Again, questions are going to vary in difficulty. You're not going to spend exactly two minutes and 15 seconds on the questions. You're going to have to let some go. They're going to get nasty. So I don't expect you to be able to do, to do 20 questions really carefully and systematically. So if you're in the ballpark of two and a half minutes per question here, you're doing fine. Some are going to be more. Some are going to be less. That's going to be your data insights experience. Typically, data sufficiency. We'll do a video on that next week. The new new ish version of data sufficiency. Typically, that's going to be faster for most of you guys. So, in the ballpark of two and a half minutes. But as you're just getting warmed up, getting started doing this, if you're a little slower than that, that's okay as you get used to what to look for and how to cherry pick for the information you want. That's one of the big keys. If you're sitting there, maybe not the best example with this question, but if you're sitting there kind of obsessing over, oh, what are all these curves doing? You only care about a few of them, right? So, over time, you'll learn to focus your eyes on the information that really matters which is probably a really good segue into this next one because, yeah, there's some weird information here that doesn't really matter. And that's the nicest hint I could possibly give you. All right, going to take a couple of minutes and good luck to you.
Yeah, this is fascinating. Couple minutes in here and not seeing a whole lot of the live crowd. Big, big group. I only see two two answers popping up on my feed here. Realize I might have a few second delay, but um, anybody watching live, please let us know how you're feeling. If you're like, I have no idea what this means, please punch that in the chat. Give you maybe 20 more seconds here. Right on. If you're watching this not live, hit that pause button if you need it. Um, okay. I, I personally, I feel like this one kind of cuts to the heart of what, of what uh, graphics interpretation data insights is at its worst or best or whatever. Again, they're, they're trying to measure kind of your real world data skills. And we can sit here and say, well, who would write this? Yeah, you see stuff like this all the time where somebody creates a graph, plunks it on your desk, and it doesn't really make any sense. And there's some language around what it means, and it's really hard to decipher. Seeing a huge range of answers from the live crowd. And, and thank you so much, everybody, for doing this. Um, there was a question that came up I want to address before. Okay, before we, we dive into this one. Um, th thank you for this, Ashan. Um, and again, as always, apologies for any mispronunciations of names. Courtney, which is better, read the question first or understand the data in the graphs, get confused on where to start. Yeah, thank you for that. My recommendation, and, and this cuts across all the question types on data insights, we'll, we'll talk about them in the next four or five videos here, is digest a little bit first. Just get your head around what is this information? So I'm going to read, in this case, I'm going to look at this and go, okay, <clears throat> can I glance at this graph and make sense of it? Working time reduction against for issue preference versus probability vote. Frankly, at a glance, first time I look at just the chart, I go, or, or that, okay, I'm not quite sure what that's talking about. And then I read that paragraph and go, the graph shows the effect of voters' previously stated preference regarding the issue of working time reduction on the probability of those voters' actual choice being the same as that stated preference. What the heck? Horrible writing, right? Again, by design. Welcome to the Data Insights experience at its most ridiculous. Not every question is like this, but this is really hard to decipher. But you're going to have a, a pretty big challenge really making sense of those questions until you kind of say, well, roughly what am I looking at here? Now, you don't want to obsess over the information because often they give you too much on purpose. And this question, once again, is an example of that. So yes, digest, read kind of the, the framing on the graph in this case, take a look at the graph, make sure you kind of understand the axes. Do your best to kind of go, this is the type of information I'm looking at, and then jump into the question. But a lot of the time, you're not going to feel super clear until you look at the question and say, what exactly do you want from me? So yes, digest first, but don't grip too hard because you'll get your, you'll waste a bunch of time if you obsess too much. Um, and I'll say more about that in the context of this question in just a second. Okay. Um, so yeah, this one's kind of weird. What's going on here? Really, the key is deciphering these sets of phrases that are up there in blue. The graph shows the effect of voters' previously stated preference. Okay, that's that. That's the bottom. That's that x-axis. So that issue preference. So some people were against, some were for, some were in between. I'm not sure what that means. But the graph shows that effect, the effect of that stated preference, previously stated preference, on the probability of the voters' actual choice being the same. Okay, so higher probability, that's your y-axis. So the higher that probability is up on the y-axis. So for example, if we look at the against, just that left little tick mark there on the uh, x-axis, and, and you go up and you say, okay, well, whatever the highest one is, that's the kind of reddish-orange zeta party. So if their previously stated preference was against, 70% chance they'll vote the same way. They'll vote against. Far right side of the graph, so far right side of that x-axis, four. I'm just going to keep picking on the zeta party because it's the nicest color that stands out the most. So people who their preference was they were going to vote for, okay, you look up the graph, looks like it's 45% uh, or so of them, the probability that they would vote the same way that they would vote for it, 45% chance that they would vote for it if their previous state of preference was four. Okay, why are we looking at this? I don't know. What's working time reduction? I don't know. No, I can guess, but that, I don't know. That's so maybe it doesn't really matter. Okay, I got my head sort of around the graph now. Now we can look at the question. Members of the blank party are most apt to vote 
according to their previously stated preference regarding the issue of working time reduction. Okay, so I'm looking for the party that's gonna be at the top of that graph. In this case, it's that dashed black line for the most part. Yeah, the Zetas once again are a little bit higher when they're against, but for the other four tick marks, it's Delta that's up at the very highest there. This is totally unsatisfying. I don't feel like I've gotten anything interesting out of this at all, but yeah, the, it looks like the Deltas are the highest or they're the most likely highest probability almost regardless of their issue preference. They have the highest probability of voting the same way as, as their state of preference. Okay, well, great. I guess that's the answer is it's Delta. And that is the answer. And this is another feature of Data Insight. Sometimes the answers just don't feel satisfying. But there we go. It makes sense. So great. Um, all right, what about this next one? Question number two, members of the blank party most apt to vote against the issue of working time reduction if their previously stated preference was also against. Who's the against? That's that blue line right there. So we already kind of looked at this a moment ago as I was trying to make sense of the graph. Yeah, that blue line, what's up at the top? What's the highest probability given that their previously stated preference was against? Well, it's that kind of reddish orangish line again. That's the Zetas and we got it. Okay, now notice that last sentence, I've got it crossed out in blue over there now. For each party shown in the graph, less than 10% of that party's voters had a previously stated preference against the issue. Absolutely irrelevant, has nothing to do with anything, has absolutely nothing to do with anything. And well, that's fascinating. Um, so, okay, extra information we didn't really need. Um, so a couple, uh, there's a question here that just popped up that I thought was really interesting. Um, Sandeep, thank you for this. Welcome, again, trying to get you in the right mindset, give you exposure to kind of the funkiest stuff you're going to see on graphics interpretation. Questions kind of tricky and confusing, but the statements are direct. That's exactly right. There's extra information you don't need. It can make your head spin initially. The graph itself, I don't think makes any sense at all. One other reason that the graph doesn't make sense. What the heck does that mean? So your stated issue preference, we're going to vote for something, working time reduction. There's a vote. You're either for it or against it. What does it mean? to be right in the middle. There's five tick marks. What does the third one mean? So you were neither for nor against and you voted that way? So I went to the polls and I voted, eh, I voted neutral. It doesn't make any sense. But guess what? It doesn't matter. So those things that don't make sense might be flawed. Yeah, it turns out it's kind of irrelevant. Very, very typical. The statements are pretty direct. Again, question number one, getting more questions about that from the live group. Which party is most likely to vote according to their previously stated preference? Notice at the very top of the graph, that dashed black line, that means that, for example, for people who stated a preference as four, the Delta party was most likely to vote according to that preference, also vote for 0.8 probability that they're going to vote for. For that next one, so the second to the right, also the highest, meaning that the, the Deltas were most likely to vote in accordance with their previous preference. So because the deltas are the highest line, at least on average, that's why your answer is C for number one. So again, try to get to the right mindset. And once again, if you're struggling on this, you see this on an actual test, you're going to see some that make your head spin. Do your best to make sense of the question. Sometimes it's going to be the case that the graph is a mess, the language is a mess, there's extra information, but you get to the questions and go, yeah, I guess that's it. I know the answer. Great. Don't let it freak you out at first. If you get to the questions and you still can't make sense of it, let it go. Don't be a perfectionist. You're not going to get all 20 questions right on Data Insights. Embrace that. And again, you can always come back to three of them, and that's okay. All right. Um, I think we covered all the questions there. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more. I'm getting questions about which materials used to practice Data Insights graphics interpretation. For now, I would re rely on the official materials just because, boy, it is hard when you look at all of the complexity of this. And some of that complexity is the ugliness of it, right? It's all the flaws, all the things we look at and go, what an awful data display. What a horribly written paragraph. Boy, we're asking a lot of test prep companies to properly knock that off. So I would stick very exclusively to official questions for now. You've got the data insights review guide. You've got the official guide. You've got the online question pack. I would concentrate your energy there. Just keep in mind, it's a limited supply of questions. Um, we might do a video in a couple of weeks here, general Q&A and strategies for dealing with uh, data insights. And we'll talk more about that sort of thing. All right. Um, one last one, and then we'll put you out of your misery. I think this one's a little easier than the previous, but your results may vary. Go ahead and take a couple minutes.
All right, we'll give you 30 more seconds for the live group. Let us know what you're thinking. If you're lost, that's great too. All right. Um, so you may find this easier or harder than the previous one. Some people really struggle here just to make sense of it fundamentally. Um, I think it's a little bit easier than the previous one. I'm getting a couple of general questions that I think are very much worth addressing. Um, and let me see if I can pull them up here. Uh, so this has come up a couple of times, and, and I apologize. There was somebody that asked this twice, and I, I didn't quite get to it. Um, another person asked the same question. If I get one of the answers wrong, entire question will be marked as wrong, I'm assuming. Yep, that seems to be how they handle it. Um, I'll, I'll ask some folks at GMAT in case there's some nuance there. But as far as I know, it's all or nothing, which again, might be another reason why if you are if you look at the question, you get started on it and you really can't make sense of it, can't make sense of the questions, can't pull anything out of it, pick your battles, let stuff go. It's not worth spending five minutes battling a question on the ground. Same thing we say on quant, but I think here it's really easy to get sucked in and just stare your eyeballs at it. Wait, what are the red dots? What are the black dots? Which is the heart of this question. Um, Question here, this is this is a more general question, I think, about the GMAT algorithm. Um, so adaptive test, all three sections are adaptive. Integrated reasoning on the current old classic GMAT, whatever you want to call it, where IR was not part of your composite score. IR was not adaptive for anybody that, that took it back then. The data insights, adaptive, so is quant, so is verbal. Yeah, the questions, it's... Broadly correct to say the questions are of the same weightage, but the, the issue with adaptive testing is that every question you see depends on your performance up to that point. So when you see question number 10 on a section, for example, your performance on questions one through nine is going to be taken into account. If you're doing well, see a harder question. Doing poorly, see easier questions. And your score isn't so directly correlated to the number you get right and wrong. It's really kind of this funky weighted average, somewhat complex algorithm. If anybody's having a hard time sleeping, give me a call, tell you all about the three parameter logistic model computer adaptive testing. You'll knock right out. Bottom line, the upshot of all that is that, yeah, it's not exactly about how many you miss, it's what you miss. So difficulty level matters. If you miss easy questions, you never see the difficulty level. Put another way, algorithm is trying to find the level of question at which you get roughly half right, half wrong. So if you make miss easy questions, questions that are easy for you, you never see the harder ones. And that's what kind of keeps a cap on your score. So that's why all these videos, quant, verbal, data insights, doesn't matter, really emphasize, execute well on the stuff you know how to do, let the rest go. That's the single most critical thing you can do for your score. Quant, verbal, data insights, doesn't matter. That's always the case. Okay. Um, let's get into this guy. Kind of messy. Um, seeing a ni nice range of answers here. Some people going, oh, hey, this one's easy. Some people saying, not easy. Um, and really the heart of this is, can you sort of decipher that they've kind of, they've really kind of taken two different graphs, x-axis, y-axis, stuck it on the same graph. You have two different y-axes. And really it's just the black ones that apply to one set of things. It's the red ones that apply to a different set of things. Okay, not so bad once you see it, but your head can kind of spin initially. So this first question, what are we after? We want to know the building with the greatest mean height per floor, and we want to know the roof height of it. So we want to know greatest mean height per floor. I don't know about you guys. Where my eyes go here is I go to that right side. Now, okay, mean height per floor. And my eyes just want to look at that dot right there at the 6.5. I want to look at that red dot. It's not the right one, obviously, because the deal is that we're only focused on height versus mean height per floor. Only the black dots, ignore the red dots for question number one. It is just the black dots. Okay, so now I want the highest mean height per floor. That's going to be the black dot that is highest up along the y-axis, that y-axis over on the right. It's that guy right there. And then just look down. What's the height of the roof right there? It's going to be between 350 and 370. Pretty straightforward. But again, it's like a lot of things here. Be careful. Make sure you're not making some assumption. What I had up there a second ago, that felt right to me in my first reaction. I went, wait a minute. No, no, no. Wait, what color is that? Wrong color. Just watch your back. Make sure you're looking at the right thing. I know it sounds stupid to a lot of you if you didn't struggle on this, but this is where the score killing bad answers come from. This is what 
Dejian, if you make these mistakes, everybody makes them. Just make sure that you're really drilling in. I'm going to watch my back, watch my back, reread, double check those labels. Okay. Question number two, correlations. Um, and for what it's worth, you're going to see that term a lot. It doesn't show up on the, I don't think I've ever seen it on the quant section, maybe once or twice at most. Um, big thing on data insights, you're going to see it on a variety of the data insights questions. Not looking for anything super strong here. Positive correlation between two variables as one thing goes up, does the other thing go up? Negative correlation as one thing goes up, does the other one go down? Or are they not correlated, meaning there seems to be no pattern whatsoever? Pretty simple definition, nothing technical going on there. But what's funky about this one is you can't just eyeball it. A lot of the questions about correlation that you're going to see on Data Insights, you can just kind of look at the data and sort of eyeball it. And, and maybe there's a scatter plot and, it, and it's, it's fine. Maybe it's a table you look at. And you can just kind of go intuitively and it's fine. I think it's really hard to do that here because we're not trying to correlate the x-axis to a y-axis. That's not what we're doing. It's the two y-axes, right? Um, so, uh, Srija, great question there, and I'm going to address that in a second about computer adaptiveness. Let me finish this one up, and I'll say a little bit more about computer adaptiveness, getting a, a whole conversation with a live crowd that I think is worth addressing. All right, back to question number two. So here, it's the red and the black I'm trying to make sense of. And hey, some of you guys walk on water, swim on air, you're brilliant. You're looking at this and going, oh, I can just eyeball that, and I can see that this is a negative correlation, and there's no problem. Good for you. Um, most people can't do that. I found this a struggle first time I saw it where it's like, wait, wait, am I getting twisted around? Let me watch my back. Very simple way to approach this um, to kind of get at the intuition. I'm kind of taking chunks of the graph. So right now I'm looking at that, that left little segment because it looks like left side of the graph, the red dots are typically below the black ones. Not always, but in general. And then on the other side of the graph, it seems like it's the red dots are above the black ones. So they've kind of flipped. But what does that tell me? Okay, let me think through it a little bit. So that first chunk right there, what do we have? The red ones are low and the black ones are high. Okay, fine. What about that second chunk? Well, the red ones are high, the black ones are low. And there you go, folks. That's the definition of positive correlation. As one thing goes up, the other thing goes down. That's, I'm sorry, did I say positive? I meant to say negative if I said positive. Definition of negative correlation. One thing goes up, the other one goes down. There's your negative correlation. Notice you don't have to worry about, is this strong? Is it weak? Is it an average magnitude of correlation? They give you strong positive, negligible, or strong negative. You don't have to worry about the strength here. Your answer is C, no problem at all. Okay. Um, a couple quick comments. So as we wrap up this last question for today, um, if you enjoyed this video, please, please, please like and subscribe. Really important to us. Helps other people find our videos and enjoy them. Um, Mark, and thank you for your participation, Mark. Really appreciate all the comments and, and questions in here. It's logic if the height of an apartment goes up, number of floors go down. You're correct, but be really, really careful because you don't want outside information getting into your head, really, for anything on the GMAT. Um, maybe you know that this is true, but who's to stop them from making a graph that goes against intuition for some reason? So yeah, we can say that sort of thing, but you'll notice that stylistically throughout this video, yeah, I'm not thinking about anything I might know about architecture. I'm not thinking about anything I might know about chemistry. Um, props to my high school chemistry teacher for two years, Bob Pearson. That dude was the best. Because um, if I sit there and go, well, I know that this thing's soluble, then I might not read the information I'm given. Take what you're given, because you never know if it's going to be something that's counterintuitive, or I don't know, maybe just made up. I don't know. So try to get the outside stuff out of your head. Usually doesn't help you here. Um, and getting some really, really, really good questions. Um, about adaptiveness. So really important thing here. Uh, and again, apologies for mispronunciations. Srijat, thank you so much for this. Um, yeah, that's what the official guide says. And when you go into the online interface, so, so two things, GMAC has told us publicly, all the a bunch of summits, bunch of uh, public releases, all three sections, quant verbal data insights are all adaptive. Uh, and in the online materials, they say, hey, we made a mistake on 215. And uh, yeah, Data Insights is computer adaptive. So don't know why they made that typo. Stuff happens, they're human. So what they published in that official guide is wrong, everybody. It is adaptive. And GMAC has published that correction online, published it publicly. So everything's adaptive on the new GMAT, um, the new GMAT focus. All right. Um, one more quick question here that I, I want to address. Um, 
So one of the answers is wrong. All of the answers to the question get marked wrong. Yes, that seems to be the case. But multi-source reasoning questions, that's the exception. So whatever you see on one screen. So what you're going to see with graphics interpretation here, two questions on the screen at a time. You miss one of those two questions. Apparently, that entire thing is marked wrong. Got to get them both right. Two-part analysis. By definition, you have two parts, two answers. Got to get them both right to get the points. Multi-source reasoning, that is typically three separate questions, completely separate questions attached to uh, one set of information. We're going to do a video on multi-source reasoning. We'll talk about all that. Thank you so much for this question, um, Adrish. And again, apologies for mispronunciations. But yes, in general, what you see on one screen on the actual exam, you miss one of those questions, you get it wrong. But when it's a new screen, new question, all good. And again, the questions are going to be numbered. Um, I wrote these as one and two on the slide to make it easier to talk about. That's not actually how it's laid out on the test. This is all going to be treated as one question. Here's question number seven in your data insights section, and there's two parts to it. So really, this is one question. Multi-source reasoning is the big exception, usually three questions for one set of data. OK, I think that's all we've got here. Um, Anything else we need? All right. Have someone table. I'm sorry. To have to... Okay. So for anybody watching live or not watching live, um, at least four more videos coming in the series. We're going to start with four more. We we might do six total. We might keep extending the series if if there's enough call for it. We see reason to. Um, but what we're doing in two days. We're going to be hitting two part analysis. That's where everything kind of comes together. It's critical reasoning. It's quant. It's kind of an LSATI logical reasoning kind of feeling thing, all rolled into one. So we're going to be doing that in two days. Bring your friends, bring snacks, bring comments, bring your energy because I feed off of it here. And then next week, episode number three, table analysis. Episode number four, multi-source reasoning. That's the mother-in-law of the questions. Real mess to deal with. Got to be fun trying to do this on a screen live. And episode number five, data sufficiency. For those of you who are familiar with the, the classic old GMAT, uh, they're making some changes. We're going to talk about those a little bit. For anybody who's not familiar with the old GMAT, don't worry about it. We'll take you through what data sufficiency really is. And again, our goal, just like with everything, don't beat yourself. That's got to be the focus. Even data sufficiency, give you a nice, clean process, help you avoid those sloppy errors that can really ruin your day, and give you a feel for what these changes seem to be with the new data sufficiency questions. All right, that's enough for today. I kept it under an hour. I'm proud of myself. Uh, once again, if you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe. If you're interested in quant, interested in critical reasoning, reading comp, plenty of videos on the GMAT Club channel, done tons and tons of stuff on both on all three of those. So uh, if you need some, some help with those for the GMAT focus, those videos are still good. Not a whole lot's changed on quant, critical reasoning, reading comp. Quant is problem solving only on the GMAT focus, but the content itself, no real changes other than the fact that geometry is gone. So if you're working on other stuff for the GMAT focus, Hit that subscribe button on GMAT Club. Lots and lots of videos. So go ahead and hit those. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you in two days for two-part analysis. Thank you so much.